Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, someone said good morning back. Thank you. Um, my name is Ron Carey. I'm the CEO of IGEA. Uh, I'd just like to welcome you here this morning. Uh, before we kick off the rest of the proceedings, I'd like to introduce Perry Wandon to do our Welcome to Country. Thanks, everybody. You no know, need to clap anyway. My name's Perry Wandon, we're under Wurrung Elder, and uh, yeah, warm and jigger, everybody. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge all my ancestors, elders, both past, present, and emerging, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I come from a place, Hillsville, where my family, well, my grandfather left the mission because he was born at Corrandurt with the rest of his family under Robert Wandoon. And he signed up to go away to World War I. And I think they just let him go because you had to get permission to go anywhere. And they were probably hoping he wouldn't come back. But he'd come back after the war and he wasn't allowed to go back on the mission because the government made a half-caste rule. So he's resided in Hillsville and six generations, we've never moved. So the whole lot of us are up there. So. Uh, sadly, a lot of them passed, as my father was uh, our last Narangita for in our modern day time. Uh, his name was James Juby Wandon, and first Aboriginal player to play for St Kilda. Yeah. And so that was 52, 53, and he's been passed now for 19, going on 20 years. And I was able to step up into his shoes as an elder, as, as we all do, you know, one passes away, sadly, so the next one fills up that. Today we've been running as an organisation since about 86, and from 35 men, women and children, when at first we were all gathered up, were angry people, that's all that was left. And the reason for that, because the boats come on, Come sure, bought every disease they could think of. Cholera just about wiped everyone along the coastline. And from 35 to thousands, who we are today. We're just doing native title at the moment and that is gonna be a big headache. The government keeps changing the goalposts. So if anyone who's got traditional owners uh, will find out or been there, but we've got the sad, sad part of looks like Every time we put something forward, the government goes, no, you can't do that. Um, why? Well, you've changed this, you've changed, no, we haven't. It's been passed down story by story, family member to family member. And yeah, the government just doesn't want to, they don't want to help. We were gladly got William Barrick's painting and his shield back there uh, a while back and I had to repatriate from uh, the State Library to the Melbourne Museum. So I'm in the process at the moment, I measured up his shield. So I'm making a replica as close as I can. So, and we did find, turned it over and looked at a couple of signs on it. There's got the mail and there's one that maybe possibly could be a baby. And then there was a map. Uh, because the government's taken away a fair bit of our land, so we're going to put it over, blow it up, put that on, and say, stick that under their noses, and now stick that where the sun don't shine. <laughs> but it's all a process which we're, I'm sure anyone that's a traditional owner will understand. Today, or the next couple of days, all week, good luck with everything, because it sounds like you've got a few things you've got to get through. So, warm and jake here, everybody, welcome. Yumin Kundi Bek Wurundjeri Wurrung, meaning welcome to the land of Wurundjeri people and stay safe too. Christmas is not far away and have a, have a real safe journey through your, for the rest of the year and all the other time. So thank you very much and enjoy yourselves. Thanks, Perry. Um, I'd just like to introduce and welcome to the stage Matt Ditton, who's just gonna take a, a moment uh, to have a talk to us. Uh, good morning. I am not your keynote speaker. Uh, I have a, uh, a sober job to do at the moment, but I promise to leave it mildly more lighthearted. Um, I'm 
here today because I've been asked to do a small memorial about one of the staff members, one of our colleagues and friends at Mighty, uh, Yasek. Earlier last month, he passed away suddenly. It was a heart attack in his North Melbourne home. He is survived by his partner, daughters, mother and father, brother and sister, and countless friends and colleagues, both here and around the world. He lived a giant life. He worked at Mighty, Many Monkeys previously, Media Saints, Taurus, Tantalus, basically everyone in Australia because the guy just freelanced for everybody. Um, he worked in film, he worked uh, in music, he toured with his band Dead Can Dance, he worked on Gladiator with Hans Zimmer, he was a giant among us. And it's important to recognize that this week will be very difficult for many because he was a feature at Melbourne Games Week and he was just a feature at every get together. A warm smile, a crazy story, and that weird Polish dude with the accent. As well, I want to acknowledge the loss felt at League of Geeks when earlier this year, uh, Adam passed away. It was uh, Trent, who I just casually met on the side of a road, who explained to me that Adam was the best of them and moving on is something that's impossible to do. So this will be a difficult week, but this is a wonderful time. Studios, some of them stay, some of them go. Games are made, games are shipped, but the people that we work with, the friends that we have, are truly the best part about this industry. So, please enjoy Games Week. Keep the people that you've lost in your hearts. And uh, when you see your friends in the corridor, linger a little longer, be kind to each other, and uh, have a wonderful time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. It's kind of not a lot I can add to that. You know, um, that was a lovely way, to, I think, to open. Um, I'm Ron Curry, as I said. Uh, my job here for the next couple of minutes is to be the warm-up act for SAVS. Um, performance, I guess, we, whatever we have, Sav's moment in the sun. So my job is just to warm you up for that. So bear with the formalities and then we'll get to the fun stuff in a moment. Um, it's hard to believe this is IGEA's fifth um, GCAP and the, the third one, third time we've done it in person. And it's something that takes the team, I guess, pretty much nine months of the year to prepare for, three months to get over. Um, and it's, it's great when we finally got, got here. I'm not sure we were all keen at five o'clock this morning when we got up, but it's exciting to, to kick the week off. We work in a really vibrant and an exciting industry. And I think, as Matt said, the, the best part about that is the people we meet on the journey. Um, you know, I was coming down the escalator with Clara, and I think I said hello to like, I don't know, 10 people just on the escalator. And it just reminds us how close this industry is and how much we, we value the friendships we make over, over a short period of time and a long period of time. And I've said it before, I think, each time I've, we've opened GCAP, but if you're standing in line waiting for a coffee, standing in line waiting to get into um, a, a talk, queuing up for breakfast, queuing up for a meal, sitting next to someone you don't know, say hello, introduce yourself. Because it's amazing the serendipitous moments that come from just meeting people at conferences like this, and how one small hello can turn into a turn into a life, 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 lifeline, lifetime of uh, of friendship. Um, we'd like to thank the people, our members, and other people outside of our membership who've really helped us to curate the next three days. It's been a huge job for the IGEA team and all those those people who have helped us pull it all together, so thank you. Uh, just a reminder, we have Meet to Match this year. Um, if you would need to catch up with any of the delegates, the Exola Big Games uh, night tomorrow night, which is just a low key, no alcohol, casual networking event, and also the Screen Australia Local Lounge, so make sure you jump in there to see some really amazing games. This year we're trying something a little new, we've got some round tables, so the attendees can take a much deeper dive into the topic. So if, 
if you haven't attended one before and you're interested, look, have a look at the program and get yourself along to one of them. So we really hope over the, the next three days that everyone is energised, that they feel connected, and they can start to build some new business relationships and find some tools and tips and tricks to help their businesses. One of the things that is difficult when we pull a, um, an event like this together is finding supporters who are going to look after th the industry and step up and, and, I guess, give both their time, their money, their resources and their energy to supporting everybody. So I'd like to give a special thanks to Creative Victoria, Screen Australia, Exola, EA Fire Monkeys, Big Ant, the City of Melbourne, Hipster Whale, I'm halfway, don't worry, Screen Queensland, Sledgehammer Games, Vic Screen, City of Port Phillip, South Australian Government, LDB, Metric Computers, NBN, Playside, Screen Tasmania, Ultimate Studios, Unreal Engine, Cam Rogers Legal, Game Loft, Paragon Interactive, Riot Games, and Screen West. So thank you to our sponsors. Okay. So is everyone warmed up? Can I hand over to Sav? Is now the time? All right, Sav. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I really don't think that housekeeping is really the most interesting part of the day. Um, so thanks, Ron, for that, for starting us on a high, and then we're, I'm going to bring everybody down. Um, I'm Sarah Wolf. I'm manager of events, content, and communication at IGEA. I also manage the content and logistics of GCAP. So the fact that you are all here means that I have done something correctly this year. Uh, it remains a consistent honor to serve the games industry in this way, managing content in collaboration with experts in their fields, working with community to find new and interesting ways for you to network and engage, and getting to review all the incredible content offered to us. Any talks you see today, please make sure to thank your speakers uh, because they are offering you their time, history, and expertise. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of them uh, for doing this again this year. Um, if you know me personally, you know I am at heart an event manager uh, and a man who has never skipped reading the terms and conditions. Uh, so IGEA always lets me stretch my legs with my favourite thing to cover at an event, which is housekeeping. Uh, to cover off some important points first, uh, in any emergency, please notify an IGEA team member immediately, be that medical, fire or otherwise, and we will escalate it. In the event of an emergency, one of two alarms will sound. If it's just a beeping, that's an alert, so you can remain calm and await further instructions. And if it's big whoop whoop, then the sign is to evacuate immediately. MCAC wardens will direct you to the safest evacuation point and let you know when it is safe to return. Um, if an IGEA team member is not available immediately, please contact one of our many volunteers. This year they are in a lovely purple shirt, and you can see the little uh, Crossy Roads chicken on there as well, as it is the 10th birthday of Hipsterwell. Um, so have a look for those guys, and they will be able to get in contact with us straight away. If you are feeling at all unwell in any way, please do not remain at GCAP. In case of illness, we do have a refound policy, and we can assure you uh, that we want you to use it. Uh, we are also providing masks and hand sanitizers at the Rego desk again, so please pop by if you'd like a fresh mask. Please be considerate of your fellow attendees, and let's work together to be as safe as we can be this MIGWA, because it is a very, very long one. <laughs> Uh, I say it every year, but when you signed up via Eventbrite, you agreed to our privacy policy and code of conduct. Please ensure you're familiar with it, as it is a requirement of entry to abide by our code of conduct. GCAP is a business-to-business -business developers conference, which means we are expecting you to behave as if you were at work. For all code of conduct violations, myself and my coworker Raylene are the main points of contact via phone, email, or getting us directly. This year we went a little different with our QR codes, which you might have noticed on the front of your badge. Uh, so if you haven't scanned your pass yet, it takes you to a very helpful link tree that has the map, the schedule, meet to match, and of course, our code of conduct. If you do have any questions, really myself and the IGEA team will be floating around during the conference, so please feel free to get in contact if you need us for any reason at all, and we will be happy to talk to you. Welcome back to GCAP. Thank you for indulging me for another year of housekeeping. Uh, if you can believe it, it is my sixth year running GCAP, uh, so I may be soul bound to the conference by this point. Um, I have known our keynote today for a long time. When I first entered the industry in 2014, she was always held up as a staple of the Australian games industry. 
Naturally, I don't know if she remembers me because I was a baby dev and I hadn't grown any facial hair yet, uh, but I was in awe the first time I met her. Starting in the industry at Atari in QA nearly 20 years ago, she has since worked across a plethora of production and design roles before joining Hipster Whale in 2016. She sits on the board of IGEA and the South Australian Film Corporation. She has previously won the Adam Lanceman Award for Outstanding Long-Term Advocacy for the Game Development Ecosystem in Australia and wants to ensure that where all scale and flavours of games making can flourish and practitioners can enjoy long-term rewarding careers. Today she comes to you to reflect on Hipster Whale's journey over the past decade, looking back on its evolution and forward to what's next. She'll explore how the studio's culture has developed and share strategies for setting focus in an industry that's reliably going to pull the rug out from under you. How do you set goalposts when everything is moving? Please welcome to the stage, Clara Reeves. Hello, I'm gonna need some of this. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Clara, I'm the CEO at Hipster Whale, and uh, I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend my welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Um, thank you Matt also for that um, memorial. Uh, the last time that I spoke to Yasek was at GCAP, um, and I'm gonna miss him a lot. Um, and thank you everyone here for being here at 9 a.m. on a Monday with me. You are real troopers. Um, today I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a story journey um, of our early days outlining how we defined our current studio mission and focus that we work to today. And then I'm gonna talk about how a robust team culture paired with that is really essential for thinking about the next 10 years in this fine industry that likes to keep changing things up on us. Um, and I have a clicker. Yeah. Um, if you don't know us, uh, at Hipster Whale, we're the makers of arcade action games such as Crossy Road, Crossy Road Castle. You may also know us from such titles as Piffle, Disney Crossy Road, or Pac-Man 256. And if, woo, too far. If you don't know me, which is more likely, uh, I've been making games for uh, yeah, nearly 20 years now, uh, and I'll do a little lightning round review of my history in game making to give some context of where I'm coming from with the talk today. Um, I got into games deliberately, um, much to the dismay of um, every adult human that I knew at the time. Uh, in my early 20s, no, like real fear, like why would you do that? Um, <laughs> uh, I knew I wanted to make uh, screen culture and more and more games were what I was finding to be exciting. Uh, it was that dynamic content that combined my love of both art and technology. Um, so despite having studied both fine arts and getting a computer science degree so that I could come and make these wonderful games, when I joined, I immediately ended up um, not in the tools at all, but mostly in production, in product direction, business strategy, and people management. I got my first real games job here at Atari Melbourne House, which was very lucky for me. Um, so I was QA manager at a quite large development studio for a very large global publisher. Uh, then the studio was acquired by Chrome, uh, which was a really large independent developer at that time. Uh, most of my time at Chrome was on second party platform games for Xbox, but I did get to know a lot of people in the industry while working here. Uh, it was 400 people at Chrome, so they've split up and gone all over the place. Uh, I was a producer for most of my time at Chrome. I went out of games for a little bit and worked at Lonely Planet. Um, and I also was a consultant at some digital agencies and some smaller game studios. I just realized I don't have a slide of Media Saints, which was um, where I first met Jacek, actually. Um, and then I was, so sorry, that's blurry. <laughs> that's my bad. Um, then I worked at Film Victoria, which is now Vic Screen, doing program management and investment and strategy for games for the state. 
Uh, and I've been at Hipster Whale for eight years now. Um, these are my Hipster Whale Scout badges that we earn. Um, they're real badges. I haven't actually sewn one onto anything yet, but I'll, I'll work it out. Um, so in my past also, I have owned and run several small businesses, some like brick and mortar retail stores, hospitality venues, and even a brewery. So operation of business, I've had a pretty wide net of experience because I apparently just can't stop myself. Please help. Um, I love making stuff and bringing stuff to market and um, I understand how hard that journey is and the, the, the passion that goes into to making something from nothing and showing it to people. Uh, all right, so that's me. Um, Hipster Whale is turning 10 this year. Uh, we are counting our Crossy Road chicken a little bit early because um, Crossy Road turns 10 next month. Um, so Hipster Whale is very different um, from what it was in 2014 when the company started. The industry looks really different too, and isn't that part of what is exciting and exhausting about this industry? It won't stay still, and neither can we. Um, I might just ask the audience, I can't quite see, but you guys all can, like how many people were in the industry 10 years ago? Oh yeah, we just started, mm, a third maybe? Um, Cool, all right, well just for fun, let's go back in the Wayback Machine. <laughs> Here are some pictures to take you back or take you with us if you were not there at the time. Uh, App Store, no games tab on the App Store. Uh, Duet is a great game. Gotta really press that. Oh, it's not working. There we go. Um, Steam. Actually, it looks like surprisingly similar, but there's, there's a lot <laughs> that's really different with releasing a game on Steam. Uh, the Wii U, no Switch. <clears throat> PlayStation 4 storefront. Xbox One, this was pretty new at that time, I think. A Hearthstone released. Monument Valley released. Amazon bought Twitch. Facebook bought Oculus, and that's what it looked like. Um, and this game came out. All right, so back to now. Thanks for indulging me in that, by the way. Um, as much as we are feverishly working on our next projects and getting on with all the exciting next stuff, uh, it's obviously an opportunity for inflection when you turn 10. Uh, maybe even more so when an IP and a brand turns 10, it's still going strong and growing. It gives you a little more scope with your zoom lens as you look back and as you look forward. Uh, we have like super ambitious plans, obviously, with our brand, um, with our team. But we know the next 10 years, like the last 10 years, will have its own unique challenges and opportunities. We're gonna be challenged. We're gonna to have to make hard choices and changes and there's no doubt there'll be opportunities that arise that we cannot yet predict that we have to adapt for. It's certainly helpful to have a lot of things tried and done already <clears throat> rolling uh, as you put those markers down for where you're going. And of course some experience and hard learned lessons. But unfortunately, none of us has a reliable magic eight ball. So one thing I know for sure is we're not going to be bored. Um, so Hipster Whale now is 30 people. Uh, we're still pretty small for the number of projects we run. Uh, we have a clear mission, what we're trying to do, what kind of games we're making, and who our audience is, uh, our studio DNA. We make action arcade games. Um, we're a genre studio. We're going to keep getting better and better at this. We make games that people will play for years, and we evolve them with our audience. Arcade stuff, our games should be easy to play and hard to master. We're always after a very broad audience, but need depth for our skilled players. We make crossy road games. Uh, this one is right now, we'll probably open that up, but right now that's a focus for our studio. We need to be proud of what we're putting our name to. 
It always needs to match the quality promise that our players and business partners expect. And we want to make money. You won't see that on the website, maybe, but it's really important, and I think we just have to be honest about it. Um, we're a commercial studio, and we need to be profitable so that we can keep going. Uh, it's an important part of our team's mission. So this stuff, it's not that complicated. It's like really obvious and simple, maybe. Um, but it means our team knows their mission, we know our DNA, where to focus, and we've been able to form our working culture around this. Um, so here's a snapshot of our culture values, and this stuff is on our website. Um, you don't have to grab snapshots of it. And we have benefits where we're tying individual value um, to our objectives where we can. <clears throat> so we can take on more than this mission, and we want to as a company with our brand and the reach we have. We can do those things with smart partnerships and with people who are experts in their wheelhouses, but for our development studio, this is our focus. So having both that focus and the team culture framework is really the stuff that we can plan around when thinking about the next 10 years and looking forward long term. <clears throat> but before we talk about that, first a story adventure from our early days when our studio formed before we had that structure or that mission planned down. I want to give you some context for how we came to define our focus, define our focus, um, and how it was somewhat forged by fire. It may surprise you that those really simple things um, were not always clear to us. Uh, it was not easy in the making, as simple as they are. Uh, if you were part of our early journey, maybe you know this really well. Um, we had a bit of a time, sorry. <laughs> uh, this is a time I will call in the shadow of the chicken. They say that to find yourself, you first have to lose yourself, and I don't know if that's true or it just sounds nice and poetic. Um, if you can just find yourself without getting really lost, just do that. Um, but for us, it was essential, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to play, hopefully it just plays, a video of Crossy Road coming together. I can't skip to the good bit, but it's coming, I promise. Um, so you can watch this as I'm talking about our early start. So here is a story, which will be a little bit like a therapy session for me to relive. Um, here's why it took us a little while to find ourselves at the beginning, especially at the point where I joined the studio and the original creators of the game Crossy Road stepped back um, to get to the place where we are now with a clear sense of our own DNA and the ability to plan a path forward. So the start of Hipster Whale and Crossy Road is not my story. Uh, that is Matt Hall and Andy Summers' story. They founded the company and they've told that story themselves better than I can. Um, I just want to keep watching this, but we'll keep going. Um, so just for fun, here's Andy sweating absolute bullets. Um, <laughs> doing an Apple keynote. Um, here's Crossy Road all over the place. Uh, you get the idea. It was one of those games, and it still is. Uh, just this year already, we've had over 18 million new players join us in Crossy Road. Uh, I joined about 18 months after the launch of the game. I was working at Vic Screen at this time, getting itchy feet to get back into game dev and making stuff again. I started having chats with Matt and Andy, who were really keen on publishing. Keep in mind Crossy Road is not even two years old at this point, so they're not thinking this game is like a 10-year game. Um, they're watching it month by month, not year by year, and expecting it to, you know, go into wind down anytime soon. In particular, they were looking to give more small, talented indie developers opportunities to get their projects funded and published to find their own successes. It was idealistic, maybe, but also not totally unrealistic at that time um, for the right kinds of games. It sounded great, and everyone's hearts were in the right place on it, so that's what I thought I'd be focused on. When I arrived, that's not exactly what I ended up doing. For the studio team, um, we had one developer, which is Tom Killen, and one Giselle Rosman, doing all the admin. 
And that was it for the internal team. Uh, everything else was external development partners, great partners like Mighty Games, now part of Keywords, but the internal team was super tiny. Um, and I hadn't realized how much Matt and Andy needed to take a break at this point. They were understandably exhausted um, from all that had happened since the launch of Crossy Road. And they wanted to go and chase other creative pursuits away from Hipster Whale at this point. So actually, my start was just making sure the wheels didn't fall off the bus as they started to hand it over to me bit by bit. And like, I've started lots of small businesses from scratch. I've worked in teams of all sizes. I'm OK to like, roll up my sleeves and just get stuff done when that is clearly what's needed. But we had three live services games that would grow as we put effort into them, two external development partners to communicate with, licensing and branding biz dev, a tiny team, and we'd kicked off publishing scouting before I'd even really come on board. So I was hands-on with Crossy Road and Disney Crossy Road in particular, um, working on new features and updates and learning deeply how programmatic advertising technology works. Uh, and honestly, it was just a bombardment. Um, I didn't have people to delegate to, so a lot was just getting stuck in, getting things done, learning. Uh, now, this actually turned out to be great because I really got to know our games. Um, but I'll be honest, there wasn't heaps of time for like big strategy thinking at this point. I just had to not fall off the horse because building up an internal development team um, was not the mission and was not what the directors wanted. I couldn't um, hire up a team to do this, but these projects needed looking after. So that was more than enough with just the existing projects, right? But um, no, because remember, that's my job. Um, so we started up multiple small project teams too with publishing titles and partnership licensing projects and all kinds of things, um, all led by really smart, experienced developers, all smart ideas, all good games. Um, here's some of those projects. Uh, this was a city builder. Um, kind of ended up looking like Crossy Road, but otherwise, mechanically, not much to do with Crossy Road. A hidden object puzzle adventure game. Uh, I know a lot about these now. Um, <laughs> but clearly, like, a big departure from anything we'd put in our portfolio today. Uh, Hyper-casual games? Um, <laughs> I cannot explain to you what is happening on this screen. <laughs> but I think that was the intention. Um, a clicker game with crossy theming, uh, with like Clash of Clans, uh, chicken. And like lots of other things that I can't show you. So we were not sitting around. There was so much going on. This quickly started to feel like we were just throwing darts and hoping we'd hit something, though. Each of these made sense in isolation. Someone was passionate about it, saw something interesting. The people were great. But they weren't super connected to us otherwise. They were set up almost like satellite projects, orbiting us, independent in what they were doing, but also a little bit tethered to us. Some were projects rather than whole studios too, so they had trouble forming their own identity and we hadn't really given them one to work with. It wasn't a good setup. Because over time, as the industry changed, which it did quickly, especially for mobile publishing, and as we more and more focused on our existing games and building up the Crossy Road brand, these came more and more out of focus. <clears throat> out of orbit with us being able to publish them for various reasons. These satellite projects were drifting further and further away from us. The market had shifted and the publishing mission we had just didn't make sense anymore with a lean setup like we had. Some of the teams hadn't had the autonomy to course correct either because they were tethered to us. During this time, we were better and better defining what our brand DNA was for Crossy Road though. And none of these projects were lining up with that either. We couldn't bring them into orbit with us. So this time was a terrible time. We had to let go of project partnerships, kill off some of the smaller internal ones. I know that was really hard for many people, myself included. A couple of those satellite projects, we had people working in our physical studio on them. So it was really like our team, as spread out as it was, was being ripped up. 
Anyone who's had a project cancelled or been made redundant, there's no sugarcoating it, it just, it's the worst. At the same time we were winding these projects down, we started to double down on our portfolio of already live games and build our audience there. And we shipped two projects that did help us hone in on what our DNA really was and started to pull our solar system into shape. The first project was Piffle. And this project felt really true to us as a studio, even though obviously it's not a direct lineup with those goals I shared earlier. The Mighty Games team had their own strong identity and it was deeply in this game. Publishing a game in mobile is never an easy feat and this was no exception, everything did not just work. But it's a game that is really loved by the people who play it and we're really proud of it. It has a clear identity and mission and it delivered on our quality promise. And the next one was Crossy Road Castle. And this is where we as a team, we had to sort of build a team, but we decided uh, we were going to run the chicken gauntlet. We knew what we had to do if we were building a development studio with our own identity. We had to make another Crossy Road game, but it couldn't be Crossy Road. We needed to take the spirit of that game and make something new. And so, at my own great peril, and despite the directors being pretty unsure about it because they weren't going to make it, <clears throat> and also the plan had not been to build up a studio in-house, we started to make a spiritual successor to Crossy Road. A new platform was coming with Apple Arcade. I'd spent a lot of time thinking about subscription, particularly when I was at Big Screen, and how retention design is quite different in those platforms. It was the time to do this. I was ready to die if necessary running my chicken gauntlet. So we continued to build up our team to make this game. We had, you might say, a concept of a plan at this point. Um, I wanted to make something that would create the same feelings that I had had as a kid playing this game, um, which I defined as a comical game that can be played together by a wide audience. If you've never played that game, it's the best. Anyway. Um, so each person added to the project team was added quite slowly and carefully, even though the development timeline for this project was less than a year. We searched and waited for people who were really genuinely aligned with our mission, and each of them accelerated us dramatically because this was still a really small team, less than 10 people. Um, so at the beginning of the project, it was okay. Then it was like, yeah, it's all right. Um, and this was to follow like a game that is beloved by hundreds of millions of people. It's actual development footage. Um, and there were those in the team that loudly questioned the project because it wasn't exactly like Crossy Road. Would this be what people wanted? What was I doing messing with this brand? Um, these were annoyingly legitimate concerns and we had to find answers. Um, we worked furiously on trying things, throwing them out, trying again, and then the project started to come into its own. We had some breakthroughs in controls, in art style, we found the metagame. With polished level design and multiplayer coming in. It was there. If I can get it to run, yay. It was clearly Crossy Road, but it was its own. At the studio, there was now that creative energy and conversation sparking all over the place that is really the magic stuff of game development. When you know you're making something that someone else is going to play, you can start to imagine their experience and it puts a smile on your face. We were doing play tests and people wouldn't hand the controller back. I'm going to be honest though, like I was so tired and frazzled at the launch of this project. Even though I knew we'd put everything into it, I was terrified at launch. I don't think I slept that week. What have I done? Matt and Andy have trusted me with their company and their brand. What was I trying to do? Making another Crossy Road game. Why did I do this to us? But it did have to happen. <laughs> it did work out. The game was really well received. It's performed really well for our studio. With this project, we transitioned into building our own projects, 
building for live ops delivery for our games and making multiplayer and social play a major component of our studio. This project is still running strong five years now and the team just launched it on consoles also. So since Castle's launch, we've had many other launches too. And of course, we have a lot of things we're not ready to talk about underway that we're looking forward to releasing over the coming years, both new projects and in our existing projects. Importantly though, the, thing, the things that we've done in the past are not gonna be exactly the same things that will work for our future. If you released Crossy Road exactly how it released in 2014 to the App Store today, same thing wouldn't happen. Same for any of our projects. We have to keep moving. We have to keep paying attention to where our audience wants to play with us. Because it's really hard. <laughs> it's not just games, like just making stuff, the creative process and doubly so if you had a commercial factor to it. It's just really hard work. And in games, we live at the very front of where technology is cutting itself to shreds and super cool new stuff becomes available to us all the time. It's like really exciting, it's also really hard. Uh, and I've been doing it like a long time now. Yeah. We're often reminded that we are eternal students and we need to keep learning. Ooh, too far. Damn it. <laughs> We're often reminded that we are eternal students. But it's also super rewarding, right? This is a picture at Bit Summit of a family playing castle together and just total heart punch. When you do make something and find a way for it to reach its audience and it touches their hearts and minds and connects them to each other in a world that can feel disconnected, that's why we're here. What a wonderful thing we get to do sometimes. So as our mission solidified, we also developed our creative culture that was built to support us achieving that goal. And looking after that culture deliberately is a major effort at the studio, from everyone, not just me. So that when unexpected things happen, that's what this slide is for. Or when we're building games that need to keep changing as they live long lives and the market is shifting. We can keep focus, be flexible where it makes sense and move our goalposts around as new information comes in if there's a major opportunity shift that we need to take into account. It's never easy, but it's not too scary because we practice it all the time and it's exciting to evolve and learn and get better and better at what we do with a team who are all motivated to support each other in doing our very best work and making the very best, most successful games we can. Now, our mission and culture values are entirely tailored to us, so they're probably not that useful in a cut and paste kind of way. Uh, our way of working doesn't suit everyone. Our mission is our mission. Uh, and I'll definitely go over time if I try and explain all of that. Um, most of this is focused around finding the right balance so we can both be really ambitious and have an exciting creative environment, but making sure people's well-being and ability to rest and recover are also incorporated because creative work is mentally draining and it's easy to burn out. So instead, um, I'm gonna share a few simple principles that I know from working in creative teams for a long time that seem pretty consistent for building reception to critical feedback. Um, so there's that robustness you need to be open to change. So this is definitely not like our whole culture focus. Um, these are just focus points that are sort of a subset or a result of the way we work around getting robustness to change. So making it safe to fail, getting input from everywhere, and maybe being careful about being nice, where some real talk is actually more kind and respectful in the long run. Um, 
Yeah, these things are like really simple. And you probably know them already, um, but doing simple things reliably is hard work sometimes. So little reminder, maybe won't hurt. And I know that maybe I have some people in this room who um, might encounter some of these things for the first time with their teams and might not have a framework for it. So I hope it's a little bit of help, even just if it's a reminder. Um, so when we're talking about all this change that we know is happening, what are some of the practical things we can look out for to make sure your team has an environment open to feedback and change? How to stay curious rather than defensive when things aren't working. So, safe to fail. Oh, actually, just I have one slide, just because I remembered when I was reading this back, I was like, it sounds like our team is just looking for negative stuff. We're like, like we're, we're really pretty <laughs> chipper, actually. It's just like, um, we just need to make this stuff easy so it's not a big deal, like no brushing things under the carpet. Um, so, yeah. Being creative often involves being really vulnerable, um, like risky vulnerable in a way that life teaches us generally not to be. We have to put our fears out on the table and show who we are, what our skills are or aren't. Um, we have to sometimes look a bit stupid in the pursuit of doing clever things. You probably all did this in high school drama class. You practice this so that when you really need to do it on stage, you're not afraid, you know you'll be caught. And you've built out that trust with a team around you. Make sure this is crystal clear in words and in practice that failing is okay and isn't followed by punishment or a hard landing. Learn from whatever went wrong, but then let people get up and try again. When new people join the studio, if they see this in practice, they see it's the case being demonstrated in front of them, then failure is not scary. It's just what we do to get through. Um, Input. Uh, of course you need direction and decision making so you can get on with things. Um, you can't just be derailed by input at all times. But in order to capture all that great information that your team knows, including great ideas but also concerns and icebergs on the horizon, you need to seek out input from everyone in your team and make sure it's not just safe to contribute, but it's meaningful to contribute. Um, what happens if people think <clears throat> or feel that they can't have input into their own work? They will check out because they're smart. Um, they stop caring. They probably eventually leave. Um, but they'll definitely stop delivering you thoughtful, critical feedback if it doesn't feel like it makes any difference when they do so. I know that we've had this happen in our studio. I've had it happen to me before. I think I've seen it everywhere I've worked, where someone sort of just, yep, cool, okay's out, and takes a step back from engaging. <clears throat> Watch out for that. It's hard to keep this up, um, but it's very dangerous to cut people out from being listened to or having meaningful input in their own work. Um, yeah, and this one, this is probably a real, like, gotcha for people thinking about what makes a, you know, a, a healthy studio culture. It hasn't really got that much to do with being nice. Um, being nice is unfortunately not always that useful when you're problem solving. Because nice can be passive and it can be used to cover up the actual truth. If you have an environment where being nice is the most rewarded thing, then everyone is gonna say the things that feel comfortable, because that's what makes you feel nice in the short term. And like, that's great for like an exchange with a stranger at the supermarket, no problems, but it's not ideal for building long-term trust and respect in your team. The problem is that in an always nice environment, um, voices that point out problems and uncertain things aren't very welcome because it doesn't feel very nice, does it? So probably something a bit more like this is useful. Um, sometimes we need to be able to say when things are not great or maybe just disagree with something and we need to hash it out. Um, there will be creative spark and difference of opinion in your team if things are going well and people are engaged and that's actually great. Um, you just need to make sure it's always resolved and that it's kept respectful. 
You can be critical of the project and the strategy and be respectful to the people involved along the way. And if you practice candid feedback regularly in lots of small ways, this just becomes second nature and it's just not a big deal. So what we're after with all of this is a team that's not fragile. They are fine with critical feedback. They seek it out because it's no longer that scary. And we absolutely want that critical feedback because we need it if we're going to be ambitious and have our best chance of success. And for people to tell us when we're veering off track, because we do all the time. Your team can call out when things aren't working and there's no retaliation. They're not being not nice or rocking the boat, they're just doing their job and helping us see better. Be brutally honest about the product, the strategy, the fears, the concerns, but deeply respectful of the people involved. Of course, be kind to the people involved. Someone's hard work is being cut or their experiment didn't work, that's tough. Show them safety, look after them, help them back up as you learn from the mistake. Now, there's a much bigger framework that all of this, what? lives in. I'm not very good at this clicker thing. <clears throat> you need um, a safe, creative environment where people are empowered to care about their actions. And their actions feel like they matter. They matter. And their environment is supportive. Um, if you don't have that bigger framework, the, the safety that's required for that robustness won't happen. Um, it's pretty simple, it's not <laughs> rocket science stuff. I haven't dropped like a giant innovation twist here. But um, staying on task to this stuff day by day is work and it's a craft in itself with lots of good reference material out there at your disposal. You can, as a team, practice and get better at this stuff and then get more and more deliberate about rallying around succeeding long term on the goals you want to take on. Here's an actual team photo. Um, as we look ahead to the future that will inevitably pull the rug out from under us regularly, where we'll need to constantly adapt to the market opportunities and shifts and how player preferences change, and the same things that worked for us before won't necessarily be the right things for what's ahead. Being aligned around a clear mission and identity so we know where to focus, although that part wasn't straightforward for us, is key, um, but also working together and fostering a safe and engaged environment so that we're able to be open to inputs, feedback, and change, that robustness, is work that we'll be investing in on our journey. Um, this is the opening of GCAP, though, so... Um, I don't think I can uh, stand here and be all rose-tinted glasses optimistic at you um, about things right now. I don't think that's helpful. Instead, um, how about that? When I think future of the industry, I, I am actually overall able to be hopeful. Um, we've got big challenges for sure. Uh, it's not all roses out there at the moment. We're in a major contraction point and the squeeze is still squeezing. Uh, lots of things that have worked before are not working anymore. Uh, it is a really tough moment in the cycle of the industry. Um, those of us who had our hand up for more than 10 years have probably been through some of these before. Um, they're all their own thing, none is like the other, but these, these, these moments happen. Um, but I can also imagine we've got some really big opportunities coming. Often when things get really tight, and the squeeze is too much, like it is right now, that's when new things do break loose. New opportunities, new shake-ups, we need to be watching for them and make the most of them. People will keep playing games. Um, the industry isn't going anywhere. It is just shifting. I want to leave you with this quote from Bill Gates. When most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. What can we do with 10 years if we trust our people, build teams based on the right values and missions, set them up to seek out and hone in on successfully making the right products for players? I think we can do a lot. I think you can do a lot. Look after your people and make safe frameworks for them to get this stuff done and be ambitious. 
I really look forward to seeing what you make in the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. It is always a huge privilege uh, to get to hear from you, and we appreciate getting to hear so much about Hipster Whale and your journey. Um, could I get another big thanks for Clara for opening off GCAP? It has been a huge morning already, so I'm not going to keep you any longer. Please head on back up to level one for morning tea. Uh, afterwards, the content streams will all start up. So your next task for today is to decide which of the amazing speakers you'd like to see next. Thank you.